methods, don't we? We use um, <clears throat> uh, academics, of course, and there is, um, there's the requirement to be diligent and consistent. Uh, of course, in a group, you know, there's the a respect for authority and uh, regard for other people. Well, so it is in athletics, amen? You, you learn to work hard, endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, persevere, press, press yourself beyond uh, what you thought was your ability. Lots of good opportunities to grow in godly character. Of course, a lot of it is, uh, is, is just discipline of the flesh at a young age, but as our young people grow, they recognize that, no, this is valuable spiritual training. How I many have come to know that there's some work involved in keeping under your body and bringing in it a subjection? Yeah. Paul says he does that with the sobriety that if he fails to do so, he himself could become a castaway. Important to learn to keep under your body, isn't it? Make it your slave. Deal with it roughly. One, one rendering, beat it. Beat your body. Yeah. So we, we beat the kids in <laughs> basketball practice. <laughs> Bryce and Steven back on the back row. Yeah, that's truth. Yep. That's it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good stuff. Come on out and support the young people. It'll be a good time. Of course, we'll be caroling again this, um, this Saturday. I don't know how many hundreds of pieces of literature were distributed on this past Saturday, but um, weather-wise, supposed to be another nice day, you know, up into the 50s again. So there'll be plenty of folks on out, and um, we'll have, again, lots of opportunity to, to sing the praises of Jesus and put a piece of gospel literature into the hands of hundreds and hundreds of people. So we're trusting Father for some fruit that remains. Amen? Yeah. And it's good for us to do it. The Bible says to go out in the streets and lanes of the city and compel them to come. Amen? And, and so in obedience to that directive, we, we go. And we thank Father for his blessing upon the good work. Anybody uh, with a memory verse from recent weeks that you'd share with us this evening? Sure, Gad. Uh, Hallelujah. Thank you. Yeah. Powerful truths there. Abiding in Jesus in that relationship will be very fruitful. But without him... We can do nothing. We can do nothing. <clears throat> Thankfully, we can walk in the Spirit. Amen? We can walk guided by God's Spirit, empowered by His grace, with the light of the glorious gospel. Hallelujah. We can be strong and do exploits. Anybody else with one? Sure. Please, Josh. Thank you. That was a great time with Pastor Ron on Sunday, wasn't it? Yes. Yep. Being justified by faith, by your good intentions. Notice I said, it's surely not by your good works. It is not nearly enough of them to, to get you in. But maybe your intentions? No. Justified by, by faith. By faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. What he accomplished on our behalf. We place our trust in what he did. And God counts it to us for righteousness. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. That's glorious good news. Well, <clears throat> I've got some other good news for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. From the other side of the globe. <clears throat> <clears throat> our, our pastor has faithfully served in ministry now for uh, quite a number of decades. <clears throat> uh, some of you may not know, but he... Uh, pastor Forb Carlson used to serve as the youth pastor there in Sterling. Uh, you know Pastor Jeff Hagland now and has for a good number of years uh, served there, but Pastor Forb Carlson was youth pastor there. He served as pastor in the church in Maine for a number of years and now has been on the foreign field for 18, 18 years. My, hallelujah. Faithfully serving there in East Africa. And you, you understand... <clears throat> Uh, the role that he, he plays. He is a representative of Calvary Temple Ministries. He's a representative of Pastor Scott. He does not personally pastor a congregation there, but he works closely with the African pastors in numerous churches there, 
principally in the western province, but there's a lot of time that he spends working, coordinating gatherings of the pastors from around the country and different uh, youth gatherings that they all have from among our churches and uh, faithfully serving the Lord with his wife, Ruth, there in Eldoret. He's quizzing the kids upstairs. That's the city that he's in, right? You remember that name? And um, <clears throat> we're very thankful for his life and for the, uh, the dedication, the commitment that he has made to the kingdom of God, to the lordship of Jesus Christ, to the people of God. He labors among the people of God to help them make it to heaven. That's what God is, has placed caregivers in the church, people that watch for the souls of others. And that's what Pastor Forb has given his life to, and we're thankful for his his, his service, the hand of God upon his life and, and for the effective ministry that he brings to brothers and sisters that we don't know, but that are very precious to God. Amen? Amen. Just I'll, I'll use it as an opportunity to encourage you to pray for, for Pastor Forb and his wife Ruth and, and, and maybe I'll use it as an opportunity to encourage you to really, really pray for his wife Ruth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Brother and sister in the Lord. But also, um, <clears throat> you know, I mentioned the family of God there in East Africa. And there's nobody that has gone on a missions trip that doesn't come back blessed at how real it is that these are people that they're just like us. They're just, uh, they speak the same language of Christianity that we speak. Not just... Not just any kind. No, man, we really talk the same language. We believe the same things, hold the same values, have the same goals. It's, it's precious. It really is. So I encourage you to consider making the trip if you haven't. And if you have in the past, consider making it again. Not too soon to be praying and uh, preparing, planning, <clears throat> scheduling it with work and saving up for it. Great trip. Great trip. Encourage people to, to, to make that if at all possible. So... Look forward to what the Lord has placed on Pastor Forbes' heart for us this evening. Pastor Forbes, please come and share with us from, from the heart of Father. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Jim. Praise God. Very thankful. Ruth and I celebrated our 42nd wedding anniversary this year. Just very thankful for her. Well, I think it's been two years since we were here. Um, I, uh, thinking about that today, how long it had been as I pulled into Krispy Kreme. <laughs> you know, pa Pastor Jim was talking about, you know, having to discipline this flesh. So I, uh, I only bought seven dozen. <laughs> and for those of you who think I'm kidding, I bought seven dozen. <laughs> But they're not finished yet. Okay. That, that, that's uh, temperance. Okay. Anyway, what I want to do is I want to give you some updates on some of our churches and what the Lord's been doing. So I want to go back a, about a year and a half ago. In the western part of Kenya, uh, in what used to be the western province. Kenya used to be seven provinces. Um, in 2012, they... they um, changed their constitution. And <clears throat> so because of it, now it has 42 counties. And so in those counties, the, um, there's no more provincial leaders or district leaders. It's governors, governors and county assemblies. And in the western part of Kenya, we, we had two churches in Busia County. Now, Busia is one of the border towns between um, Kenya and Uganda. <clears throat> and uh, we had two churches there. Uh, one was in a little town called Murumba, and then about seven miles away was a little town, well, still is a little town there called Butala. And the people, uh, Kenya has roughly 43 to 48 different, actually, I think they have 48 counties and 43 tribes. And the the major tribe in the western part of Kenya is the Luya tribe. 
and it's, it, it's L-U-H-Y-A, so Luch, yeah. And um, then they have sub, sub-tribes, and then right next to them is the tribe known as the Luos. And there's a, there's a people that have intermarried many, many years ago that uh, were intermarried between the Luos and the Luyas, and that particular people are now referred to as Marachi. Marachi is a Luo word meaning bad people. <laughs> and and from, what, from what I've experienced, they live up to that testimony. Um, it's been very difficult in those churches. Uh, we've had to bring some discipline to some pastors, and we've tried to... Uh, see them stay in ministry, but just receive the, the, the discipline and the training that they need to grow. And in Marumba, uh, we actually had to get out of there real quickly because uh, Mildred is Luya, and she recognized in, their, in the Luya language them saying, let's pick up stones. And so we left quickly. Um, and then we had weekly ministry in the Marumba church. First, Pastor Joseph of Eldred would travel three and a half hours every Sunday morning to go minister in Marumba and then come back another three and a half hours. After a year and a half, we sent another man there. His name is John Etwasi. And I'm going to talk about these men in a little bit. Um, but, but John Etwasi was one of the deacons in the Kakamega church and very strong uh, example of the believer. Uh, his, his home was in order, uh, just a, a, a true, true example. And so we began to use him and his wife. They would go every, every Sunday with their children. They have three children. The daughter's name is Layla. The oldest son is named Forb and the youngest son is named Jeff. And it's, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how, how they came up with these names, but it is kind of interesting that Jeff is very active and he's always getting Forb in trouble. <laughs> so, uh, so again, living up to the testimony. But um, there are times when, when I'll ask, now, now he's Pastor John. John, how, how's Forb doing? Did, did you tell him that this is happening? And he said, Pastor, you know, we can't tell Forb anything. He just talks all the time. <laughs> So <laughs> he just won't stop talking. And so, uh, again, the testimony goes before him. Uh, and so John was bringing ministry there to the, the Marumba church. And in February of 2022, we needed to bring some discipline to the pastor in Butala because we found out he had two wives. Now that's common among Luyas, but not scripturally. And especially in Calvary Temple, our pastors are not allowed to have two wives. And we've, we've, had, to bring, we've had to bring correction and we've seen pastors who literally went and publicly set one wife aside that they, they hadn't lived with for 20 years. But to clear their own conscience and testimony, they went and publicly said, I support this woman, but we are no longer married. This one only is my wife. And it's a very significant thing in that culture. And we've seen pastors who are willing to do that. Well, this man, it turned out his house was very out of order. And in the process, we found out that he had a second wife. Before we found out he had the second wife, we tried to help him because his house was out of order. And he said, I'll submit to the discipline. And so what we did was we brought Pastor John from Marumba, seven miles away, to Butala. And we said, he's going to help you. He's going to bring pastoral care until your pastor can be raised back up again. And so the next day, that other pastor started a new church. He, he left us, started a new church. So Pastor John and his family moved from Kakamega, no longer bringing weekly ministry 
but they moved to Butala and he became the pastor there. And the work that he did was extraordinary. It just, he, he quickly just really developed the heart of a, of a shepherd. He loved the people. But what, what are they called again? Marachi. Okay. So the Marachi continued being Marachi, bad people, and really resisted him, really came against him. And so a year, almost two years later, he has three faithful people in his church. And they were people who came from Marumba. They were coming seven miles every service faithfully. And at that point, we had to determine, you know, uh, we love these people. They have clearly rejected, uh, though that doesn't make us quit. But we needed help in the Kakamega church. And so we closed Butala and we moved John and his family back to Kakamega. So now he's an assistant pastor in Kakamega. Now I'm going to stop right there and we'll come back to that. Okay, because I want to go to the next thing chronologically. Typically, Ruth and I <clears throat> would <clears throat> come back at this time of the year. Our grandkids are still young enough. They're in the Christmas program and parade. And, and so we want to be back uh, at Christmas time. When they get to be youth, um, we'll, we'll have a discussion. We've have a, had a few so far. Um, my, my hope is that we come back during basketball season. Ruth's hope is that uh, we pick a more moderate time of the year for weather. But, um, but we typically come back this time of year. In 2022, when they did the building project in Sterling, I asked Pastor Scott, can we come back now? I'd really like to be part of the project. So that's what we decided to do. So we came back in August of last year. And as soon as we got to Sterling, Pastor Ron told me, he said, we got a call from this one ministry in, in Kenya. And it's a ministry that uh, has opened. Ha, have any of you heard about the books that Pastor Scott is? I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I was hoping you didn't forget since Sunday. Um, but we're an open door for this one uh, Christian ministry. And Ron went and he's ministered there a couple times. They called Sterling and they said, do you have somebody that could come and minister at our, our youth conference? We would like somebody to come and minister on the Holy Spirit. So normally, and it's always right after Christmas. So normally Ruth and I wouldn't be in Kenya, but we were in Kenya in August. And Pastor Scott said, Ron, tell him we'll send four. So it, it was determined we were going to spend time at this one particular ministry and we were going to minister on the Holy Spirit. Before we went, I, I called the young man who oversees the ministry. And, and I said, we, we had spoken and, and I knew what he wanted me to teach on. Uh, the theme, there always has to be a theme in Kenya. I mean, if it's a wedding, there's a theme. If, if it's a graduation, there's a theme. If it's a birthday party, it's a theme. I mean, everything. And, and they love bureaucracy, titles, and names, okay? So the theme was going to be off of uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So before I went, I, I wanted to know where they stood specifically doctrinally. So I called the man and I said, I said, where, where does your ministry uh, believe when it comes to tongues as the initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit? And he said, well, we believe that everybody who's filled with the Holy Spirit will eventually speak in tongues, but it doesn't have to happen right away. So I said, OK. And and I knew God didn't send me to set him in order nor to correct their doctrine. So what I did when it was my opportunity to speak, I said, well, the theme is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through the scriptures that show when people were filled with the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And you'll see that everybody who the Bible said was filled spoke in tongues. 
And so what I'm telling you is today for you to believe what the scripture says and you'll have faith to be filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And so that's how I did it. And so I told them, this is what the Bible says so you can have faith. And so I spoke. And then at the end, I, I had asked, even though it, you know, it was still early in the conference, I said, I'd like to pray for people. And so uh, it came time. I gave some simple instruction. And then I said, we're going to pray. And based on the word of God, I believe that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit today, you will speak in tongues because that's the evidence that the Bible gives us to help us believe. OK, 365 people instantly filled with God's Holy Spirit. I mean, it was it, I, there are a few times in Kenya I've had opportunity to minister on the Holy Spirit. Probably one of my favorite subjects to teach on is the Holy Spirit, specifically seeing people filled, especially people who have have religiously sought for many years and to just see them look at it simply and believe and be filled with God's Holy Spirit. And so it was interesting because I got I got the testimony later and I thought this this young man didn't listen very well um, because he said, Pastor Forbes, it was great. He said there were 65 people who were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues that day. And there were 300 people who had been filled some other time, but had never been, never spoken in tongues before, but they spoke in tongues that day. So we know, according to the Bible, 365 people were filled with the Holy Spirit that day. I spoke with him after that. And he said, he said, it's, he said, we're getting calls all the time. He said, we're on YouTube and on the YouTube channel, people are watching the service and they're, they're calling us regularly and saying, Hey, I was just watching this thing. I was filled with the Holy Spirit today. Do you know what the Bible says? Yeah, we know what the Bible says. And that's what God does. So that was an exciting thing, how God ordered our steps to be part of that at that time. Um, a lot has been happening this last year, specifically in our Kakamega Church. Now, the Kakamega Church what, is the first church that was started by Calvary Temple. Pastor Ron and Pastor Tony went in 1999. The church was started in the year 2000 and uh, it was in Kakamega. It's funny because if you talk to people in Kenya and you tell them our first church was Kakamega, a number of people have asked me, why? Why would you go to Kakamega and start a church? It's a very, very hard place, hardened uh, by religion and, and a people, I want to put it as kindly as I can. The, the Luya tribe is not known for being industrious. Okay. <laughs> uh, a lot of them, if they make enough money in the morning to have supper tonight, they'll stop working. They won't work in the afternoon. They've got supper. And so they're not industrious. Was that a nice way to put it, Jim? Yeah, <laughs> he's met a lot of them. And um, a very, very hard place. And the Lord ordered our steps to be there. Well, the Kakamega Church has been struggling quite a bit. And we, we really started to notice it this year. They had been on a specific piece of property renting for the last nine years. And now their landlord said, uh, or the sons of the landlord, the landlord passed away and the sons said, we want to develop this property. So we had to find a place to move. And in the process of needing to move, it was going to be a, a, a big venture for a small church. And so Pastor Scott said, let's send Pastor Joseph from Elderit. Pastor Joseph, who is the assistant pastor in Elderit, let's send him in the month of September and have him bring the word on Sundays so that Pastor Solo and Pastor Tom, Pastor Solo, the senior pastor, Pastor Tom, the associate pastor, so that they can focus on moving to the new plot and the people still get ministry of the word of God. That's one of the, the privileges that we have of being a ministry that has direction 
and guidance from somebody that God has chosen to be able to see from a, a, a perspective that's a, a, a greater vantage point, not just in, in importance today, but over time and space. And so Pastor Joseph began to bring ministry there in Kakamega as they were shifting to a new plot. In the process, he began to see how weak the church had become. That Pastor Solo uh, was dealing with a lot of the fear of man. And so there were some hard situations that he wasn't dealing with. And so there were some situations in the church where people's lives were out of order. And number one, the standard wasn't being held up and saying, no, that's not the scripture. But number two, when you don't teach the word of God, the people don't have the strength to do what's right either. And when I say teach the word of God, we're not talking about just teaching the Bible for, for Bible knowledge. A pastor teaches the people, leaves them in pastures where they need to go for strength. And so in Kakamega, you need to teach strength and industriousness. You know, you need to teach not giving place to um, uh, the culture. Um, the, in the Western area of Kenya, there's a real mixture of religion and witchcraft. And it's come into the church. There, there are groups of people that call themselves intercessors. And what they'll do is they'll go for, in the town from house to house and they'll say, God told us to come here and pray over your house. And so then what they require for us to pray over your house, you need to give us a chicken. Now, now chickens are used like gold or, or silver or, or money. In, I mean, in some people, chickens are gold, all right? But uh, as, as a means of exchange. So they'll require a chicken. And then what they'll do, they have this little bag with bones probably from the chicken from the last house, but I'm not, I don't know that for sure. But then they'll throw the bones into the house and then depending on how they land, these people read them and then know how to pray. That's witchcraft, okay? And it's intercessors. So it's, it's common in many of the churches of the West and it's acceptable. I'll share more detail later, but let me tell you about Pastor Joseph. When he went to Marumba and when he was going to Butala, Pastor Joseph is, he just, he's a mighty man of God. He is a man of prayer. He is a man that leads people to the Lord most days. He has such a, a heart for the lost, but he's very, very keen in the aspect of discerning of spirits. And he was going, even during COVID, he was going out to, Mar so I guess that was quite a 2020, early 2020. And so he was on his way one Sunday. We happened to be in the U.S. Saturday night, he was feeling very unsettled in his spirit. And, and he, said, he told his wife, he said, I don't want to go tomorrow. He said, there's just something, something's wrong. And she said, why don't you call Pastor Peter, the, the senior pastor and elder, and why don't, you, why don't you just talk with him about it and you guys can pray. So he called Peter and, and he said, Peter, there's, there's just something in my spirit I'm, I'm feeling about tomorrow. And Peter said, well, let's pray. And then after they prayed, Joseph said, well, you know what? The last thing I remember is Pastor Forb told me to go to Marumba on Sundays. So I'm going to go tomorrow. So on his journey... He feels very troubled in his spirit. He pulls off to the side of the road. Whoops, I mean, he pulls off. We're on the left there. He pulls off to the side of the road and he calls one of the people from the church in Marumba. Now, they were having to meet in homes because of COVID. And he called this guy and he said, I'm not coming to your house today. I'm going to go to this house. Can you let people be aware? And the guy says, but we've prepared. People know to come here. He said, no. I'm not coming there. There's something in my spirit. I'm not coming there. And so he went to the other house. And when he got to the other house, he got a phone call from this guy 
who said, whatever you do, don't come. The police are here waiting. They've heard that there's a, a pastor who's gathering people together here in the midst of COVID. And they've been waiting to arrest you when you got here. So that was Pastor Joseph just in the spirit. So about four months later, no, this is right after COVID. So maybe early 2021, he goes on a Sunday and he said, as soon as he got to the plot, he said he was very disturbed in his spirit. And he told the people, he said, he said, we're not going to start service till, till I feel a release in my heart. He said, we need to pray. There's something unclean in here. And so he began to pray and he began just saying, Lord, what is it? And so he, he stood up after about 20 minutes. He said, we're going to take authority right now over witchcraft. Witchcraft that wants to affect you and your homes. And he began to take authority over it. And then he said, now we can have church. So they, they worshiped the Lord. Then he taught the word of God. Afterward, this woman came running up to him. She said, Pastor Joseph, I don't know who told you, but my mother-in-law is here today. And she told me that after church, she was coming to my house. And that she, because God told her that she needed to pray over my house. She's an intercessor. And she said, when you began to take authority, she left. And so that, Joseph is very keen on those things. He's known now in Marumba and Butala as the Kikuyu prophet. Now, that's not necessarily a good title because Kikuyu is another tribe that they hate. OK, so it's kind of that Kikuyu, but it's also um, he's a prophet of God. And we've God's used Joseph uniquely and very strongly. I, I spoke with him last week and he said, Pastor, when I got to Kakamega this morning, he said, he said, I couldn't do anything. He said, I had to go to the sanctuary. There was something unsettled in my heart. And he said, they came looking for me. And I said, nope, I'm here in the presence of God. Leave me alone. And he said, I, I felt a release in my spirit. I went in and talked with the pastor. And, it, and when I got in there, I knew it was wrong. And I spoke to the pastor about something. And he said, that's right. That's, I didn't see it. And so thank God for a man like Joseph who is used by God, but also think of the simplicity. He feels he, it's during COVID. And so he knows that they're watching. But what was his thing? Last thing I remember hearing this is Pastor Forbes told me to go to Maroon on Sundays. So how am I going to do it? I'm going to do it in faith. And in that time, God used him. So as he began to go to Kakamega this year, he began to see some areas that were out of order. And... <clears throat> We already had a senior pastor there. And so I encouraged him, bring help to the senior pastor. Share with him, this has to change. Give him the strength, pray with him. And it began to, to bear some fruit, but still a real weakness. And so at that point, Pastor Scott said, we've got a church in Butala of three people and our firstborn church is suffering. So we closed Butala. We're bringing ministry to those three people once a month in their home. They're listening to Pastor Scott's teachings. They have his books. They're wanting to retain their identity as Calvary Temple, and they're believing God for a church to be raised up in, in their community again. If you think about it, pray for the people in Marumba. It's Robert, his wife, Sarah, and a lady named Rose Bella. Okay, now you may laugh when you hear Rose Bella. I can't. My name's Forb. So it's not like I can say, oh, what a funny name. Um, so, so Robert, Sarah, and Rose Bella. So they're in the Kakamega Church. Joseph has continued to bring ministry. Uh, there will be a meeting. On Friday in Eldred, Pastor Rob is flying to Eldred on Friday. The three pastors from Kakamega, now it's Solo, Tom, and John. They'll be coming to, to Eldred to, to get some counsel from Pastor Scott because the church needs to be strengthened even more than it is now. Um, 
and, and some order brought. And so Joseph is now going as an apostolic representative like we find in Titus chapter 2, for this cause I left you in Crete, that you may set in order and address those things which are lacking. So that's what's going on in Kakamega. And so uh, when, when something changes in Kakamega, or whether for the good or if there's further direction, uh, at that point we'll, we'll make sure that we let Pastor Jim know and he can share with you so you, you can continue to pray for what the Lord's doing in Kakamega. Um, let's talk a little bit about Eldred. That's where I live. Eldred is called the City of Champions. If you, if you ever watch a marathon race, and I, I, I've never met anybody outside of Kenya that has watched an entire marathon race. <laughs> you know, it's watching people run for two hours and eight, sec uh, two hours and eight minutes, okay? <laughs> There are a lot of things that you can do. A lot of, a lot of things. I'll come back to this one. You know, the, well, I come back again, you know. But at the end, it's normally a Kenyan on the pedestal. Kenyans dominate the marathon races. Those Kenyans are from Eldoret. And that's why we're called the City of Champions. One reason specifically why they're champions is because Eldred is 7,000 feet above sea level. So we're almost a half mile above Denver, Colorado. You ever notice what happens when, whether it's an NBA team or a college basketball team or a football team that goes out to Denver, they normally get winded. You can see them sucking on oxygen on, on the sideline because the air is thin. We're a half mile above that. So when th with them training in that air, with less oxygen, they come down to Boston and they're like sucking pure O2. I mean, so, so their, their lungs are expanded and the stamina that they have, a lot of it is because of that environment. The, the first gold medal for Kenya was won in 1968. I remember watching the race with my dad. It was the 1500 meter race. And there was a man from Kenya that won. His name was uh, Kip Kano. And I remember specifically because he beat the world record holder, whose name was Jim Ryan, and he beat Dave Waddle. And those were my two favorite runners when I was a boy. Now, you can tell I quit following runners a long time ago. Um, but, but last Thanksgiving, we were in Kenya, and we were, went to a missionary's house who was having a fellowship with a Thanksgiving meal and they had invited somebody from Kenya and it's Kip Kano. Poor guy. I sat next to him for an hour asking him questions, you know, <laughs> and, and he's one of my heroes there. He really, and he told me the story of the day he ran his race. He said, nobody knew about altitude training. And in 1968, the, the Olympics were in Mexico city, which is about a mile above sea level. He wasn't sure that he was going to run the 1500 race. He said he decided that morning he wanted to. So he was on the team bus on his way to the stadium and they got caught in traffic. So he got out of the bus, no shoes. He ran for two miles, got there in time to sign his name, lined up and won the race. Okay. <laughs> because of training. All right. So that's where we live. Eldred. Eldred is our, our ministry national headquarters. The senior pastor is Pastor Peter Gitau. And very, he's, he, I, I'm so thankful for Peter, not just as a, a true man of God, but also as my closest friend. Uh, Peter, I have such high respect and regard for him. His, his shepherd's heart and his stand for the gospel and, and the way he does things with excellence. Um, I could stand here and just give you testimony after testimony of the people in town that know who, who Peter and Joseph are. The testimony in town is if you want someone to pray for you, go to that church in Pioneer. It's called Calvary Temple and ask for Pastor Peter or Pastor Joseph. When they pray, God does something. And that's their testimony. So, I've worked with Peter now for 18 years. My first day in Eldred, 
they were about to have a, a, a DT teachers meeting and, and Pastor Tony introduced me to Peter and he said, can I ask you a couple questions before this meeting starts? And that's how our relationship began. And we're very close to this day. Every Tuesday we go out for ministry at a coffee place, uh, <laughs> coffee and, and croissant. Um, and we just have good fellowship and just see how God's leading there. Uh, in the elder at church, Peter also very, very keen to the spirit of God. Both these men, I told you, when they pray, things happen. Regularly, and I would say at least three times a month, we have somebody in Eldred, most of the time they come to our church property or one of our services that God delivers from demons. And these men are very quick to take authority over the enemy. Peter is used very uniquely in the word of knowledge to the point where sometimes it almost scares me. The detail that God gives him and, and, and how precise even the timing is in either, 20, I think it was 2021 or 2022, I think 2022, we had our national young adult retreat. And during the first service, during worship, Peter goes up and he said, let's stop for just a second. He said, the Lord just showed me something. He said, we need to deal with it. He said, there's a woman here. He said, you've, you've had two abortions. You're pregnant right now and you're planning to kill this baby. And God said, stop being a murderer. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, you, that's not a time to go get a drink of water or, I mean, he said, in fact, you need to come up right now. And I'm like, ooh, <laughs> you know, I don't, that doesn't happen in America. And people wouldn't come forward in America, but this young woman came running to the front. Please, God, forgive me. Pray for me, somebody. And now she has a child. <laughs> but just that, he, he came to me just, well, during our, our last youth retreat, and he, and he came to me during the service, during Sunday morning service, or right after the youth retreat, during Sunday morning service. And he said, for... I, uh, I'm just troubled in my spirit. I said, what is? He said, he said, the Lord revealed to me that there's one of our, our youth that's involved in sexual sin. I said, all right. I said, uh, you can deal with it publicly or you can go to him afterward. And uh, he said, all right. So he went to the young man after the service and it didn't go very well. The, the young man refused him. He said, no, 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 I'm, I'm fine. Peter called me that night. He said, Pastor, this is what happened. He said, now let me tell you the rest of the story. He said, I didn't tell this young man. He said, because I felt I need to, I really need to get some guidance from Pastor Forb. He said, God told me this young man's involved in homosexuality. Homosexuality is illegal and will get you put in jail in Kenya. And it's very, very rare. And I said, then Peter, that's, if that's what God showed you, that's how you minister to the young man. And the young man broke and repented and has drawn close to the Lord and has drawn close to Pastor Peter knowing that his soul is cared for. You know, that's, that is of so much more value in the kingdom of God than the 700 Club where they, every, they're, they're going to have a word of knowledge. God can use them. But they, get, they have a word of knowledge of somebody getting healed, but they don't even know if that person's a Christian. Here in the church, a young man who's being captured by the devil and God gives his pastor supernatural understanding into what, how the enemy's trying to, to get this young man. <clears throat> the week before we left, he comes to me during worship service. He said, there's sin in this room. He said, God told me who it is. And how do, you, how do you want me to deal with it? And it was during our young adult retreat. And I said, well, because he's from one of the other churches, go to him afterward, tell him this is what God told you, and then make sure his pastor is aware of it. And sure enough, when he went to the young man, the man says, oh, he said, I want to be free. He said, I don't, I've been fighting this. I didn't know what to do. Thank God for coming to me. And now his pastor was able to, to bring him some, some counsel. Those are the guys I get to spend time with in Eldred. 
praise God. And, and their testimony, three times a year now, there's one of the best high school basketball coaches in Kenya who holds a basketball camp for one week at the sports club in Eldred. And every time Calvary Temple is there sharing the gospel, they specifically ask, we want Pastor Peter to come and share the gospel. His testimony among the basketball community is one almost bordering on reverence. God has used him to touch people's lives. There's, there's a hospital, and I might have told you this a few years ago, a hospital in Eldred where Peter and Joseph go to the lunch hour meetings. And they, they, have, they are looked to as past, these are our pastors. And they're quick, very quick to say, no, I am not your pastor. I am a pastor. You need to go to your pastor with this. Well, I can't do that. My pastor won't do anything. Well, then why are you there? If you want help, I can help you, but only if you're part of my church. And, and these are professional people. These are people who, some of them travel around the world speaking at conferences, which is kind of hard for me to grasp. Kenyans going and instructing other people when it comes to medical things. Um, <laughs> you may think, well, why? Well, let me tell you the main reason why. Two hours from Eldoret, there's a village. Two, two hours away from Eldoret, there's a village. And in that village, they do brain surgery. Three men in a hut with lamps and no anesthesia. Okay. I'm skipping that lecture. Okay. <laughs> but some of these people who are, are nationally, Kenya nationally known, come to Peter and Joseph asking for prayer. They've said, can you come pray for my demonized son? Can you come? My, my daughter is insane. Can you come and pray? And we've seen a number of people uh, set free <clears throat> through that ministry. We had, we had a, a man come to the gate of the church one day. And he said, I'm here to see Pastor Joseph. And they said, well, he's, he's at the hospital today ministering. There's another hospital. And it's, it's a, a cancer hospital. And a lot of it is just hospice as people are living their, their last days. Many, many people have given their hearts to the Lord. Some of them within hours of going into eternity. But some of them have gone home back to their village. They, they called Joseph one day and they said, Pastor Joseph, we just have to let you know. Last month, when you prayed for these people in our hospital, for the first time, we've had a full month where nobody in our hospital died. Because of the sustaining power of God's grace and, and the gospel. So Joseph was at the hospital that day. So he comes back to the church and this man is, is from India. And he said, let me tell you my story. He said, I'm a Christian. He said, I've married a Kenyan woman. He said, my family sent me to Eldoret to work for another Indian. There's a large Indian pac, uh, uh, um, population in Kenya. They, the, whether it's running auto, auto supply stores or hardware shops or, you know, supermarkets, there's a large Indian population. And he said, I came to work for an Indian man here. When he found out I was a Christian and when he found out I was married to a Kenyan, he said he sacked me and he said the money that I earned last month, he's not going to give me because he hates me because I've forsaken the Hindu religion and the cleanliness of the Indian people. And he said, my family hasn't been eating. I've been looking for, for a job. I didn't know what to do. Yesterday, my wife went into town and she was asking people, can I, can I wash your laundry? Can I, can I do something to get, to get money for my, my family to have food? And a woman heard her and said, wait a second. All right, I don't have anything to give you, but send your husband to a church called Calvary Temple in Pioneer and ask for Pastor Joseph or Pastor Peter because when they pray, something happens. So Joseph said, well, then by all means, let's pray. While they're praying, the man gets a phone call and a job offer. <laughs> yeah. 
So these men, God uses them. And, and it's just to see them, but they're, they're men of true humility. They're men who are good at teaching the word of God. Um, Peter clearly is the senior pastor. I, I am not the pastor there. And if I want to teach on a subject, I'll ask Peter. Now, I know who I am in his life. He considers me his pastor. But the people in his church, I want to make sure that they're receiving the ministry that he feels they need to receive. And almost all the time we're in complete agreement. But there was one time he said, could you teach on this first? And I'm like, sure. You're, you're, the, you're the presiding elder here and I want to help you in whatever way I can. And so that, those are the men that are leading the elder at church. I'd like to give you three testimonies of something that God did this last year in the elder at church. <clears throat> First of all, um, there's a television station in Eldoret. It's called Sayare, S-A-Y-A-R-E. And it, it stands for Sauti Ya Rehema, something and grace, mercy and grace or something like that. And that's the television program. Uh, the, the owner of that station knew Pastor Ron many years ago. And now we've come back into relationship the man is one of the most well-known religious leaders in Kenya. And he and I have become very good friends. And periodically, I'll just call him up and I'll say, are you free for coffee? And he said, he said I just picked up the phone to call you. Forb, let's, let's go have coffee. And he tells me what the Lord's doing. And the favor that we've received from that television station, Pastor Scott has a broadcast every Sunday night at 8.30. He also has a radio broadcast Friday nights at nine o'clock. Those are considered two of the top times in the nation. I'm not sure why, but that's why he has those times. We've been on that station now for probably six years. They had a, they had a period of time of, of 16 months, I think, where they weren't allowed to broadcast because one of the people in their office stole money that was supposed to have been going to the the government for taxes. And so the government shut them down. That whole time, we continued giving them a monthly offering. And they said, you know, we'll make it up to you after, after we can, can do this again. I said, no, that's not how offering works. We don't pay you for our time. We are blessing your ministry because we believe in what you're doing. And so this man, this man personally watches all of the the programs first. He loves Pastor Scott's teaching. In fact, he was, was it October, I think, or September? This man was in the U.S. and actually came by and spent some time at Pastor Scott's house uh, in fellowship. They love Calvary Temple. Now, there are some, some men in Eldred who are very well known, mostly because they make themselves well known, okay? some very proud religious leaders. And they've been part of Sayare for years and years. Early in 2023, Sayare was going to, uh, they wanted to dedicate to the Lord a new a transmitter that was going to help them reach all of Western Kenya. And so they asked us to come. I couldn't come because we were having a pastor's conference. So I said, can I send Pastor Joseph? They love Pastor Joseph at Sayare. He just, his, his testimony among them is, is just, he brings joy. He always encourages them. So he went. While he's there, they, you know, did their bureaucracy and stand up, sit down, all, recognize all these different people. And the, the owner, his name is Eli or Eli Rop. He said, and he turned to this one bishop. He said, we've been together for 15 years. He said, I've brought, broadcast your, your program. He said, and then he said to this man, we've been together 10 years. And these are the, the biggest bishops in town. He said, and then he moved on. He goes, no, let me come back. He said, when we were shut down for 16 months, you left us and went to, to another station. And then wanted a discount when you came back. I'm going to ask Pastor Joseph of Calvary Temple to pray over this transmitter today. Joseph normally dresses like this. Okay, 
wherever he goes. These guys in their, you know, robes with the backwards collar and, and uh, suits and big vehicles. And Joseph comes in a little Toyota Corolla. And, and he said, and I'm going to ask him to pray because Calvary Temple is our friend. They supported us when we weren't broadcasting. They love us. Joseph, pray over this transmitter. So in the process, they told Pastor Peter, we want to give you free airtime every Sunday morning at 1030. That's the prime spot for the whole week because a lot of people stay home after COVID now and want to watch it on television. And so for free, Pastor Peter is on every week. There are times during this last year, Peter has either been at a basketball camp and somebody asked him to pray. He was at a funeral about 100, uh, maybe 75 miles away. Somebody asked him to pray. When Peter prays, people stop and they come up. I heard you on site. You're Pastor Peter. Can you pray for me? So <laughs> that's the testimony we have. Earlier this year, Peter's in his office and he gets a phone call. And it's a woman. And she said, I need some counsel. I, I need somebody to pray for me. He said, okay, where are you located? She said, I'm outside your gate. <laughs> she said, I got your phone number from, from your signboard. And he said, yeah, come on. So his wife was there with him and, and he began to counsel this woman. And she said, when I was a young lady, I got married to a man who I thought I was going to be his first wife. After we got married, he took me back to his ancestral home and I found out I was wife number three. There's something unique about wife number three. She has to raise the children of one and two. Okay. So she raised everybody else's children. So she was the lowest of the three. And she said, I had no way out. I was poor. She said, I, I loved God. I, I became bitter. She said, finally, six years ago, I left him and I haven't been to church since. She said, I want to go to Mombasa, which is on the coast of Kenya on the Indian Ocean. She said, because a lot of Germans, for some reason, the Germans have invested a lot of money in that part. And I want to find a German man and marry him. Because, and, and so, well, why? Well, because... My life is absolute the pits. And in my thinking, that's the absolute opposite. Okay? I'm going to be blessed if I marry a German man. So Peter said, that's not scripture. Do you know God wants you to serve him? Do you know that Jesus is the one that died for your soul? And as he and his wife began to bring ministry, she began to cry. She repented, gave her heart back to the Lord. And was so thankful. And so she took 200 shillings out of her pocket. Two, 200 shillings is approximately a dollar forty, dollar somewhere there. And she said, thank you for praying. Most pastors and bishops in Kenya, they won't pray for you unless you give them money. And some of them, it's big money. The equivalent of like 100 or 200 US dollars. It's really sad. And Peter said, we will not take your money. We don't charge for prayer and we res refuse to receive money after prayer because prayer is to God, not to men. And she said, but, but my life has been changed. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, I'll give you a book for 200 shillings. And he took out, I think it was Prevailing in Prayer by Pastor Scott. She said, okay. So she gave him 200 shillings. He gave her the book. She turned over. She goes, I know him. She said, I listened to him on the radio. She said, look, she pulled out her notebook out of her purse and there were notes she had been taking from Pastor Scott's teaching. She said, God led me here today. I'm not going to Mombasa. She's been part of our ministry ever since then. You know who took her under wing was Flora Bett. Now, Jim lived with Flora and her husband when, when he was there for, for a few months. And Flora really began to bring discipleship to this woman. They were, they're both from Caricho, uh, a Kalenjin town in Kenya. And Flora began to minister to her. She'd call her on Sundays and say, Are, is your, your alarm set for tomorrow? 
do you need transport? I can help you with transport to get you to church. And it touched this woman so deeply. This woman's been here ever part of the ministry ever since she moved closer to the church. Then she moved closer again. And now the little community where she is, she's bringing people to church and she's calling them on Saturday nights and saying, are you ready for tomorrow? Do you need transport? She'll go to their house on Saturday and help them do the laundry so that there's no excuse Sunday morning. And, and she is reaching her community the way she was reached. Okay. Now, her name's Padina. She is a very active part of the ministry now. She, she really encourages people, but she loves to share the gospel. Typically, we'll do outreach in Eldred one or two Sundays a month where we'll just go out, <clears throat> sometimes by families, sometimes by small teams, and we'll just look for people and share the gospel with them. About two and a half, three months ago, Panina, one of the young adult ladies and one of the youth, they went and they knocked on a door and there was a man there whose name was Edwin and they shared the gospel with Edwin and his heart broke and he said, I want to receive Jesus. So he came to the church struggling, really uh, oppressed. So Pastor Peter got with him and said, I want to pray for you. Let's see God set you free. And the guy said, well, first, let me tell you my story. He said, I'm from Western Kenya. He said, and when I was nine years old, my mom died. And my father got remarried right away. And the stepmother threw us out of the house. My brother was 14. My daughter, my sister was 12 and I was nine. We went and found a farm to live on and we worked on that farm and we lived in the barn and they fed us. And that's how I've lived till I was uh, 15 years old. He said, 15 years old, I forced my way back into my father's house. He, he let me in. He began to pay for my schooling. He hadn't gone to school since he was nine years old. And he said, but my stepmother bewitched me. She put a curse on me. And ever since then, he said, my life has been hell. He said, I can never sleep for more than an hour at a time because the moment I fall asleep, there is something just, that's just beating me. And he showed Peter bruises. And, and there are demons that just would beat this man during the night. And he would cry out in torment. He said, I went to Nairobi to try to get away from her and, and from her influence. He said, he said, I found a job. He said, I, I found somebody. I got married. The, the stepmother, I keep in my mind, I almost keep calling her the wicked stepmother, but this isn't a fairy tale. Um, she came and she bewitched this wife of mine who, who left me. My life fell apart. I was living in the slums. And he said, so my life has been torment. So I went back. My father died. So I went back there to, to claim my inheritance. And when I got there, she had convinced all the legal authorities in that area that I was illegitimate. So I have nothing. He said, but then I found another woman and I wanted to marry her. And my stepmother loved her. So I thought, well, this is going to be good. He said, the two of them have been bewitching me ever since. He said, my life is continual torment. He said, I came to Eldred to escape just to find daily work. I've been living in one small room with five other guys. He said, all we do is sleep, get up and work, sleep, get up and work. He said, I can't sleep. My life is torment. He said, I didn't know what to do. I was at my wits end. I was just going to run to the western, western part of Kenya and if I die, I die. And there was a knock at my door. And there's this woman in your church. Her name's Penina. And she came and led me to, to Jesus. I want to be set free. So it's really cool because Peter prayed for him. Two days later, asked him, Edwin, how is it? Edward, Edwin says, there's still torment in my life. And Peter said, well, let's find out why. He said, because we know that at the name of Jesus, every knee bows. So he said, what is it in your life that you refused to give to Jesus when you gave your heart to him. And the guy says, oh, that? Peter says, yeah. Okay. And I don't know what it was, but he said, I give it up. Jesus, I want you to be Lord. Peter prayed for him that day. That's been six weeks. And the man's never had another demonic attack. All right. 
So thank God for the power of the Word of God and for a pastor who isn't just, well, let's pray again. Let's, let's get to the root of this thing. And then there's another man. His name's Abednego. This is the third testimony. Abednego uh, was living on a farm, doing okay. Young man, probably 22, backslidden. He saw Peter on Sayari, and he said, he said every time he watched, his heart was pricked. That's, that's the truth. So he came to the church and gave his heart to the Lord. So one of the men in church gave him Pastor Scott's book on uh, walking in the spirit. So he began to, to, to read it. He loved it. And so Peter got with him one Sunday afternoon and said, Abednego, how, how's it going? He goes, he said, well, I've, I've read this book. He said, I, I don't understand the Holy Spirit. He said, but you know, I was a Christian and I backslid and, and I'm not worthy of anything God would give me. I just, I, I just want to make it to heaven, but, but I feel like I need more. And, and Peter said, well, there is more for you, but nothing that we get from God is because we deserve it. God gives us everything we don't deserve. He takes away the shame of what we do deserve and he takes away its power in our lives. And when he, when he said that, he said, Abednego, let me pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, yeah. So the guy, guy just stood there. Peter told me he prayed for the guy. And in less than 30 seconds, this guy is like, it's like a damn burst. And this guy was just praising God and worshiping in him in another language. And just all of a sudden, after a minute and a half, he stopped. He goes, whoa, what was that? <laughs> Don't you love that simplicity of receiving from, from God? What was that? <laughs> you know, and I think of all the times where you know, I pray for somebody that I'm trying to listen. You know, that, that's not Swahili and it's not English, but eh, no, that's NBA talk. I understand that. <laughs> that's not tongues. But just the simplicity of the word of God and people who believe it and, and pastors who will say this is who we are. And if it's true, we're going to pray for you and we're going to see God set you free. I, do, I am delighted to be an elder. Okay, just so thankful that that's where God chose to place us. We've got the best weather in the world. Uh, literally, every day is around 75, every night's around 58. It might rain or it might be sunny, but that's the temperature. And I love it. Okay, <laughs> and God's been good to us there. Let me finish with just one last testimony. That's, that's towards this year. In... In July of this year, I don't know what happened, but I got sick. Just a number of odd um, uh, <clears throat> symptoms that would go for like a week at a time. I'm, I'm reluctant to go to a doctor to have, to have anything diagnosed there. Remember the lecture I told you about earlier, right? Okay, so <laughs> there's literally one hospital that everybody who's ever gone there that, I'm, that I know of, Anybody from the church who's gone there? The doctor says, you need your appendix taken out. <laughs> so, so I don't know if it's a premium that they get. I don't know what it is. But I'm not going to go and say I have a headache. Oh, yeah, we need to cut you right here. Um, but so I actually um, was in contact with my neurologist here. I've dealt with migraine headaches since probably 2003. And uh, I... I got a telehealth visit with her. She said it, it seemed like I was probably dealing with something called EBV, which is Epstein-Barr virus, which about all of us have in our bodies, most of us. And it just lies dormant till the perfect storm hits and then it shows itself. And it's the one that, that where people get mononucleosis. That's one aspect of it. There are other sicknesses that can arise from it. So it was about seven weeks of just a, a real, real difficulty and and I, I had my blood work done and, and white blood cell count really high. Those things start working on your mind and, and just, just became a real trial of just finding, finding a grace to, to trust the Lord, to not try to think too much and to just believe in his goodness. And, and so it became hard to get to sleep at night, but I treasured those times, just times just with the Lord. And, and just pouring my heart out to him. And, 
and just knowing that it was one, one specific night when I was just asking the Lord, Lord, I don't know, I need you to take this away. I don't know, do you, do you need to touch my body? Lord, what is it? And I just felt like the Lord said, will you trust me? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And then I thought of some other things. And it's like, he said, no, I'm just asking you, will you trust me? And, and all of a sudden I, I began to realize that my view of God and healing was almost to, to the aspect of, all right, if this person's sick, God, can you come from heaven and, and touch this person? But then I began to think of God as the, as, as the creator. And I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on this. But, you know, the Bible says that God said, let there be light. On the fifth day, was it that he created the sun and the moon and the stars? God doesn't wake up every morning to open the window to see if the light is still there. He doesn't cause the sun to rise every day. He spoke and this universe has been turning for the last 6,000 years. Even the light of stars that in the natural world would take 11 billion years to get here. He created that light to get here. And we see those stars. When God said, let there be, it began. And he's just overseeing his creation. And that's why he can say, I'm not going to flood this earth again. Seed time and harvest, they'll remain. This earth is going to continue to go. And, and when I saw that, I thought, you know what, Lord? All I'm asking you is let me see that which Jesus began in Pilate's judgment hall when he, he, those stripes were laid upon his back. Lord, just let me see the, the manifestation of that which you already did. I'm not asking you to come down and touch me. I'm not asking for some mighty move of the spirit. Lord, let me just see what you began. And that the grace and the peace that it brought. I, I look back now. And the times I spent in the Lord's presence, I can honestly say those are of greater value than I thought I didn't want this. You know, that trial is precious because of this that I received from the presence of God during that time. We're thankful to be, to be used by God. We're thankful to, that, that he saw fit to, to send us where we are, to sustain us where we are. Um, I, I can't help but tell you how what we have as Calvary Temple in our missions program is so simply biblical. We, we fellowship with other missionaries in Eldred. And whenever they come back to the U.S., they've got to spend so many miles on the road finding a church that will give them a little bit of money. Some of them, are, many of them were never sent out by a church. Some of them just sent themselves. And so they're looking for sponsors. There's one missionary, and you know what he does now? He has this ministry in Eldred, but he spends most of his time in Nairobi trying to be an influencer on Instagram. And he's become a male model. And he's not even pretty. All right? <laughs> and that's how he's trying to get money to sustain his ministry, where when you look at the scripture, whether it's Paul saying, send Zenos the lawyer with speed and in the Greek it meant and provide for him or the church at Antioch, which sent Paul and Barnabas and then they came to bring report or whether it's uh, Peter and John that were sent to Samaria to see them filled with the Holy Spirit. What we have is so simple according to the scripture and pure. And we, I thank God for that almost every night. Lord, you've been so good to us. You care for us. You love us. And what we're seeing now, oh, I, I'm sorry. I know, I know we're late. I got to throw this one last thing in. I think you're probably aware that a number of weeks ago, the Kwanjenga church burned. And now the two churches, Kwanjenga and Kwamaji, have merged. And God's, I just want to let you know, God's doing a great work there. Pastor Rob's doing a great job of taking those four pastors, the two that were already in Komaji and the two from Kwanjenga, and looking for the wisdom of God, how to now take and put all of those kids and teachers in DT, all of those deacons providing care for the people, but not have 
the Kwanjenga deacons with Kwanjenga people, you know, and Kwamaji with Kwamaji, <laughs> but really see the, the hearts of the people knit together. And almost all of the people from Kwanjenga will have moved to Kwamaji by the 1st of January. So God's doing a tremendous work there in what began as a tragedy. Praise God. Hallelujah. Pastor Jim. To do his work when his people look to him. Amen. People make themselves available when people call on his name in prayer and faith. He's, a, he's a, such a mighty God and a wonderful, loving, heavenly father. I, uh, <clears throat> I know you've all been blessed by the testimonies. And I will again just uh, encourage you all not only to, to pray for Pastor Forb and Ruth and, and the good work there, but uh, let, the, let the word uh, stir all our hearts to look to Jesus ever more fully, more fervently uh, for his work in our lives, he, <clears throat> he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we would ask or think. Amen? And his eyes do go to and fro throughout the whole earth that he might show himself mighty on the behalf of those who, who walk uprightly before him. Amen? Let it be uh, real and big in our hearts that we desire to see Father honored as he, as he moves in us and in our midst. There's a, a night coming when no man can work. And we ought to be a people soberly about the work of the kingdom. Amen? Seeing souls saved and established in their walk, seeing the powers of darkness beat back and seeing a bride prepared for Jesus' soon return. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you. We bless your holy name, O Lord God. Father, it's, it's exciting to, to think of your work around the world in the lives of all your people in your love, in your holiness, in your power, separating unto yourself a, a holy nation, purging and purifying hearts and lives, equipping your people, to do the work of the ministry. Help us to be mindful and prayerful. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Father, we do pray your blessing upon our brother, Pastor Forb, and his wife, Ruth. Bless them mightily, spirit, soul, and body. We trust you for wholeness, soundness, and strength in our brother, O oh Lord God. May your hand be upon him mightily, continuing to use him for your glory in this good work to which you've called him, O oh Father God. <coughs> we trust you, O oh Father God, for healing virtue, for manifestation of Yes, that finished work of Jesus having born in his body on the tree sickness and weakness and pain. Trust you for that, Father God. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll be sure and greet one another if there's opportunity to greet our, our brother and his wife. <clears throat> go in peace. God's love go with you all.